Beloved, I want to be honest because I'm a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ who speaks truth to power and love amid the darkness, but I'm also a woman of faith in a world where truth is attacked daily and love is disguised as triumph over instead of power with the people. I don't know what it is to preach when hope is a lie in 2018, when hope is a joke in 2018, when healing for a nation is nothing more than a hymn and not a prophecy of God's for God's people, when our voices are caught in anger toward one another instead of holy indignation against the injustice of a government that privileges the few and harms the many, I'm not in the business of lying. I'm not in the business of sugar-coated candy corn gospels that keep us subdued under the sweetness of its taste but slowly kill us with its contents. You see, hope has always been what God will do for us and never what we will do for one another. Because God is ultimately the one who saves and yet we have a God who hopes as well, who dreams for us, who gives us imagination and vision and prophecy to bring about love, justice, mercy, and truth here and now. And this hope is not in God's self, but in us. God's hope is in us. But we're too busy keeping our eyes high above our neighbors' heads to bring our gaze down and look them directly in the eye to look for help. See, he is risen. It's not just a church phrase we repeat out of habit, but a declaration that the one who died is not dead. The one who loved among us is still among us, that the one who gives life is not far away, but is with us, in us, and around us. We are the body of Christ because he has risen. We read in the gospel this morning a lesson about prophets who are honored everywhere but in their hometown. See, I'm preaching in a town that is not mine about things that are prophetic, that were I to travel back to my hometown would not be received without compromise on my part as the one who gives the word. You see, I think this is in part because those who know me believe that I'm a contributor to their comfort in whatever form it may be. Maybe it's their whiteness or their fear of the other or even their complacency within systems that benefit them and myself while literally killing those who aren't in power. Prophets are prophets because what they preach isn't sweet but somber and soft and difficult to touch if you've never known the pains of another. When Jesus says prophets are not without honor except in their hometowns, I think what he meant was preachers preach everywhere, but when they preach to those most like them, the heart hardens because to witness is to know the pain of another, to witness is to testify to what we've gone out of our way to see, the cries of the oppressed, the song of the silence. We testify to those who have yet to hear what it means to be a holy body in a sea of bodies that will not love you back. We testify that hope is dead when we are disengaged, when we are unable to speak in the face of death and devastation and war, we testify to those who are in our lands because we are prophets of God, sent by God to bring hope and love and healing to a nation that so desperately needs it. 
We read in the Gospels, Jesus, a prophet, is with honor in foreign lands. But when it comes to his hometown, he is cruelly treated, disregarded even, and without honor given to him in other places by other people. Why is it that the one with all wisdom and all the love of God within him is not embraced by his community but rejected outright? What happens when our prophetic witness in our community of the United States of America is not embraced but rejected and diminished and silenced? I want to know why prophets cannot remain in their hometowns, why preachers cannot preach in their own denominations, truth keepers and justice seekers cannot sing in their own lands. Why can we not sing when our song is God's song? Now I am convinced that our lives are more than just flesh. That Jesus is the risen one, not to show us simply the power of God, but also the hope of God's people. That when our backs are against the wall, the gift of singing is like a written prophecy in the book of Ezekiel. You see, the dry bones cried out, no hope. They were in the grave and they cried out, no hope is here, but in our singing, in our weeping, in our protest, in our marching, our praying, our screaming, our lamenting, we prophesy to these bones and sing, open these graves, bring us up from these graves so that these bones may live, breathe on us, breath of God, put your spirit within us so that these bones may live when we preach even as it's rejected, even as it's rejected, make no mistake, we are prophets prophesying to these bones. Stand up, rise up and live again and move again and be enfleshed again, fully alive, fully amazed by the gift of the Spirit inside of you. You see, I'm here to tell you this morning that our lives they're not just moments in history or snapshots in time, but breathing testaments to the glory of God in this land and abroad. You're not the prophet Ezekiel, but you are the book of insert your name here. And your gift to this world is that you continue living boldly with the knowledge that your hope is inside of you already that your life is a gift to the God who created you, that your testimony is God's scripture for a dying world who needs to hear the power of hope now. I bet you're wondering why I'm preaching from such a strange place this morning, a lectern where preachers never preach and lay servants often read or pray or ask for offertory giving. You see, I'm preaching here today and not over here or down there because we tell ourselves the most powerful word preached must come from the places reserved for ministers and reverends, for pastors and poets, for those whose calling is invested in the word being a sign of hope for all of us. However, I think when hope is located in one or two places and not inside of us. We are utterly lost. See, you are a preacher. You are a preacher of God's word because you are a child of God, because you are a human of worth, because you are alive and breathing and present and awake. You are a preacher because you woke up this morning when you could have stayed in bed. And you are a preacher still, even when you stay in bed, because you tell yourself, if I can't get out today, maybe tomorrow. You are a preacher because your mom told you you couldn't, and you told the world you could. Because your daddy told you you were nothing, and you, made, you grew up to be somebody. Because your auntie or your uncle made you feel like you weren't a person of worth, and you grew up to tell the world what it means to be a person of dignity. You are a preacher. In a world that cries no hope, you are a preacher, and your pulpit is your strength to keep going every day, and your preaching is your life being fully lived in the presence of others, and it is a powerful word. It is a mighty song. It is a hope of God that you keep on preaching. You see, Jesus preached. He preached 
and was rejected. He sang and was silenced. A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, and Christ came to make the world his home, our savior our Holy One, our God incarnate, knows what it feels like to live so fully and yet be rejected by the world around you. But this is the good news this morning, that we are living forces of hope. And that when we keep on keeping on, keep on singing, keep on praying, keep on preaching, keep on telling the world the truth of our hope. We are the body of Christ made present again and again and again in the world and Christ is here and salvation is now and life is abundant again and again and nothing will keep us from what we were created to be which is this, love and light and healing and hope and the promise that all are worthy of God's gift of grace. When hope is just a phrase or a campaign slogan or a sign to seek, it's lost on us because we're seeking something outside of God's creation. But when hope is the power of Christ's presence in and among us, we are finally free from waiting on its coming and instead are active agents in its movement. God has not abandoned us. We cannot abandon ourselves. We cannot abandon one another. We cannot continue on believing that God is gonna reach his hand out of the sky, smite the evil ones, save the good. We must remain vigilant, keeping close to one another, speaking softly, no, speaking boldly, yes, that our salvation is your salvation and my salvation bound up together into one. So instead of waiting on God, we must turn to one another now and preach and preach and preach the hope of our lives which continue to speak in the face of hopelessness. My life is not a tool of God's to speak words of truth in ways that carry power. It's a gift of mine to do those things. My life is a hope that all people who wish to know love can, regardless of who they are or who they've been told they are. My life is a hope that women can speak in churches, not in protest, but in love of life. My life is a hope that young people can carry the burden of the generations before and after, and that white bodies can sing a song of lament in a land of white supremacy. Hope is not far away. Hope is here when we keep our lives at the center, our being the operative word. Jesus is the risen one who keeps us in love, who keeps us together, in love. He is risen, and because he is risen, we are alive too. We are alive and must continue living, knowing our lives are the word of God made present here among the world that so desperately needs a word. We are alive and must continue living because the book of, insert your name here, contains a prophecy, contains a prophecy of God's not yet spoken, that all will be well, all will be restored, the end is not near, our lives are not meaningless. Our fears are not the final word. Your story is my story, is God's story, is the hope for the healing of the world. Do not lose it. Do not let them take your story away. Do not let them take it from you. Change it, commodify it, tear it apart, deny it or sell it. It belongs to God. It belongs to the one who is love. It belongs to the one who created you, who came to show love and save us in love. Do not lose it, keep it. Keep it and preach your life. 
Keep it and preach God's hope. Keep it and preach love where the world says there is no love. Keep it and preach hope where the world says there is no hope. Keep it and preach God's grace, God's goodness. Preach your goodness. Preach my goodness and our goodness and let us heal again and let us love again and let us sing again and let us hope for more than what we can see again. You see, for somebody who wasn't sure how to preach a sermon about hope, the moment I think about our presence here, our breath filling this space, our singing as more than just a song, suddenly what felt impossible is suddenly possible again. This sermon is not about hope, though. It's about preaching in 2018. It's about what it means to give a word in a world where words are used to hide the truth instead of illumine the truth. It's about what it means to keep living life when life is a daily battle to prove you are worthy of existing. It's about singing a song where others have sung before and have been told those are just notes on a page. It's about saying, I am an active agent of transformation in all of it by being the very person God created me to be. What it means to preach in 2018 is letting go of how we thought hope would come and looking inward where hope lies and looking outward where hope resides. And now let us sing the song that God has placed here and it's this, God is with us, God is for us, God will never leave us or forsake us. We are not alone here. Our hope is in God. God's hope is in us. Amen.